It's 1965, a cold morning in Dearborn. The factory floor smells like oil, hot steel, and cigarette smoke. Outside, the world is changing fast. Muscle cars are grabbing headlines. Horsepower wars are escalating. Every manufacturer is chasing bigger numbers, louder exhausts, faster quarter-mile times. On one side of the building, engineers are obsessing over big V8s, high compression, big cams, horsepower numbers meant to win races and headlines, engines that scream, explode, and sometimes die spectacularly. These are the engines that get magazine covers, the engines that inspire posters, the engines that teenagers dream about. And in a quieter corner, something very different is being born. No flashy brochures, no racing trophies in mind, no glory, no magazine editors calling for specifications. Just one question. How do we build an engine that refuses to die? Most people have no idea this moment even mattered. Most enthusiasts skip right past it. Most history books ignore it entirely. But what happened next quietly changed trucks, fleets, farms, and work sites across North America for the next 30 years. This is the real story of why Ford's 300 inline six outlived entire V8 families and why it might be the most successful engine Ford ever made. You think you know Ford engines. The 302. The small block that powered Mustangs and became a legend. The 351. Cleveland and Windsor variants fighting for dominance. The FE big blocks. The 390. The 427. Le Mans winners. But this one? This one survived when all of them were gone. This one kept running when the others became parts bin memories. Here's how. Back in the early 1960s, Ford had a problem. Actually, several. America was building like never before. The post-war boom was in full swing. Highways stretched across the country. Suburbs sprawled outward from every major city. Power lines crisscrossed rural America. Farms were mechanizing fast. Small businesses were booming, and they all needed trucks that worked. Every day, no excuses, no breakdowns, no drama but Ford's truck engines weren't keeping up. The Y-Block V8s were heavy, thirsty, overkill for light duty work. They made good power, but they cost money to feed and maintain. For a contractor running five trucks, fuel costs added up fast. Smaller inline sixes existed, sure, but they were weak, underbuilt, and tired by modern standards. They traced their lineage back to the 1940s. Good engines in their day, but their day had passed. Fleet buyers were complaining. They needed trucks that could run all day and still start tomorrow. They needed trucks that didn't bankrupt them at the gas pump. They needed trucks that mechanics could fix fast and get back on the road. Farmers were complaining. They needed engines that could idle for hours running power takeoffs. Engines that could pull heavy loads across rough fields. Engines that survived dust, mud, and neglect. Utility companies were furious. Their trucks spent half their lives idling, running generators, powering equipment, sitting in traffic. They needed engines designed for exactly that kind of abuse. They didn't want speed. They wanted torque. They wanted simplicity. They wanted an engine that could idle all day, pull hard at low RPM, and still start tomorrow morning without complaint. So Ford did something unusual. They didn't ask, how do we make more power? They asked, what never breaks? That single question shaped everything that followed. The result was the Ford 300 cubic inch inline six, introduced for the 1965 model year, destined to become one of the longest running engine designs in American automotive history. On paper, it didn't look impressive. No one would call it sexy. No one would put it on a poster. But look closer, 300 cubic inches, that's 4.9 liters, a massive displacement for a straight six. Bigger than many V8s of the era, bigger than anything else in the inline six category, the bore was 4.0 inches, a nice round number, easy to manufacture, easy to machine. The stroke was a long 3.98 inches, almost four inches of piston travel with every revolution. That long stroke mattered, a lot. It meant torque, big torque, right off idle. The kind of torque that moved heavy loads without revving, the kind of torque that contractors and farmers actually needed. 
It meant the crankshaft was leveraged hard every time a piston moved. Maximum mechanical advantage, maximum work from every combustion event. And it meant the engine didn't need RPM to work. It didn't need to be wound up. It didn't need to scream to deliver power. It just pulled from idle to redline, from empty to overloaded. It just pulled. Compression ratio, a conservative 8.0.1 at launch. Not high enough to cause detonation problems. Not high enough to demand premium fuel. Just enough to make efficient power without stress. Later versions crept up to around 8.8.1 as fuel quality improved. Horsepower numbers were modest. Around 150 horsepower in early carbureted form. Later climbing to about 170 with fuel injection. Nobody was winning races with those numbers. But torque? That's where the story changes, around 260 to 265 pound-feet, at barely over 2,000 RPM. Think about that number, that's big block V8 territory, that's serious pulling power. And it arrived at an RPM where most engines were barely awake. Most V8s had to rev to make that kind of pull. They needed 3,500 or 4,000 RPM to hit their torque's peak. The 300 just leaned into it, right off idle. No waiting, no winding up. And that wasn't an accident. Ford engineers intentionally overbuilt everything. The block was thick, really thick. Cast iron that weighed more than it needed to. Cylinder walls so heavy you could only safely overbore them by 0.30 inches before hitting water jackets. And most engines never needed boring at all. They wore so slowly that rebuilds meant new rings and bearings, not machine work. The crankshaft was forged steel, not cast iron like economy engines. Forged. Strong enough to handle power levels Ford never officially advertised. Seven massive main bearings, not five. Seven. Each main bearing cap was huge. Heavy. Overkill by passenger car standards. But Ford wasn't building a passenger car engine. They were building something that would run for decades. Those seven main bearings spread the load across more surface area. Less pressure on each bearing, less wear, longer life. The connecting rods were thick, almost agricultural. They looked like they belonged in industrial equipment, not a truck engine. Pistons were simple, durable, and forgiving. No exotic designs, no lightweight components. Just honest iron and steel built to last. This engine wasn't designed to rev to 6,500 RPM. It was designed to live forever at 2,200. And then there was the valve train. Simple overhead valve design. The same basic layout that had worked since the 1950s. Proven, reliable, understood by every mechanic in America. One camshaft in the block, push rods, rocker arms, nothing complicated. Solid lifters in early versions. Hydraulic later. Both designs worked. Both designs lasted. No overhead cams to add complexity. No complex timing chains to stretch and fail. No exotic materials to crack or fatigue. Just iron, steel, and geometry that made sense. Every component was chosen for durability, not performance. Every design decision prioritized longevity over excitement. But the real genius was how the inline-six layout itself helped longevity. Think about it. An inline-six is naturally balanced. The firing order and piston arrangement create perfect primary and secondary balance. No shaking, no vibration, no forces trying to tear the engine apart, no secondary vibration like a V6. V6 engines fight themselves. Their geometry creates imbalance that requires counterweights and dampers. No rocking couple like a V8. V8 engines have forces that try to twist the crankshaft, requiring heavy counterbalancing. The inline six just runs smooth naturally, inherently. That meant less stress on every component, less bearing wear from vibration, less fatigue over millions of combustion cycles, less chance of something shaking loose. Mechanics noticed it immediately. When they worked on these engines, they felt the difference. The smooth idle, the lack of vibration at any RPM, the sense that the engine was loafing even when working hard. One fleet tech reportedly said, these things don't wear out. They just get tired. And even then, they kept running. Tired engines and other platforms needed rebuilds. Tired 306s just needed a tune-up. Maybe new rings, maybe bearings. But the bottom end kept going. 
But of course, nothing survives on design alone. The real test came in the real world. Construction sites where engines ran all day in dust and heat. Delivery routes where trucks started and stopped a hundred times a day. Rural highways where help was hours away. Oil fields where conditions destroyed lesser equipment. Snow plows where the engine ran for 12 hours straight in freezing weather. These engines were abused daily. They ran hot in summer. They ran cold in winter. They ran with dirty oil. They ran with cheap oil. They ran overloaded. They ran overstressed. They ran when they shouldn't have been running. And they didn't quit. Stories started accumulating among mechanics and fleet managers. Engines with 300,000 miles that still had original bearings. Engines that survived conditions that should have killed them. Engines that just kept going no matter what. Meanwhile, Ford's V8 lineup was changing constantly. The 260 came and went, a brief experiment that didn't last. The 289 evolved into the 302, good engine, but it changed, adapted, evolved. The 351 split into Windsor and Cleveland variants, two different engines sharing a name. The FE series faded into history. The 390, the 427, legends that couldn't survive emissions. The MEL engines vanished entirely, forgotten by most enthusiasts. Emissions laws hit hard in the early 1970s. Fuel economy standards tightened. Insurance costs exploded for performance vehicles. V8s were detuned, strangled, or killed outright. Compression ratios dropped, horsepower numbers collapsed, engines that once made 400 horsepower suddenly made 200. But the 300 inline six? It just adapted. In the 1970s, when emissions regulations threatened everything, Ford didn't scrap it. They revised it. They made it cleaner without making it weaker. Compression ratios dropped slightly to reduce emissions. Cam timing softened to reduce overlap and unburned hydrocarbons. Carburetion was cleaned up with leaner mixtures. Power dipped a bit. Maybe 15 horsepower, maybe 20. Reliability didn't budge. In fact, many fleets preferred the emissions-era engines because they ran cooler and lasted even longer. Less stress, less heat, longer life. By the 1980s, Ford introduced fuel injection. The engine became known as the 4.9L, same displacement. Modern fuel delivery, electronic fuel injection transformed it. Cold starts improved dramatically. No more choke adjustments. No more flooded carburetors on winter mornings. Throttle response sharpened. The engine reacted faster to driver inputs. Fuel economy increased. More precise fuel metering meant less waste. Emissions dropped further. Better combustion meant cleaner exhaust. Horsepower climbed back toward 170, nearly matching the pre-emissions numbers. Torque stayed right where it belonged, still making peak pull at barely over 2,000 RPM, and now the engine was nearly unstoppable. Stories started spreading through the trucking industry, through farming communities, through fleet management offices, Half a million miles on original bottom ends, 700,000 miles with just basic maintenance, 1 million miles, documented, verified, real, no rebuilds, original bottom ends, original cranks, original blocks, you'd pull the valve cover and see sludge from years of irregular oil changes, pull the oil pan and find nothing alarming, bearings still within specification, crank journals still smooth, Cylinder walls still showing crosshatch from the factory. One mechanic joked, the truck rusts around it, and that wasn't far from the truth. Fenders crumbled, frames corroded, beds rusted through, and the engine just kept running. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, Ford had an odd situation on its hands. They had modern V8s with roller cams, better heads, more power. The 302 and 351 had evolved into sophisticated engines, and customers kept ordering the old 6. Fleet managers specifically requested it. Farmers insisted on it. Contractors wouldn't consider anything else. Why? Because downtime costs money. A contractor doesn't care about quarter-mile times. He cares about getting to the job site. A farmer doesn't care about horsepower bragging rights. He cares about finishing the harvest. A fleet manager doesn't care about magazine reviews. He cares about keeping trucks on the road. They care if the truck starts at 5 a.m. when it's 10 below zero. 
They care if it pulls a load without drama or complaint. They care if it comes home at night ready for tomorrow. And the 300 always did. Even when abused. Even when neglected. Even when everything else failed. There were problems, of course. No engine is perfect. The long intake runners could crack over time. Thermal cycling and vibration eventually found weaknesses. The exhaust manifolds could warp. Years of heat cycles took their toll. The oil pump could wear after hundreds of thousands of miles. Eventually, everything wears. But failures were slow, predictable, fixable. No catastrophic surprises, no sudden death, no engines grenading at highway speed. And that predictability made it legendary. Mechanics could plan for maintenance. Fleet managers could budget for repairs. Owners knew what to expect and when to expect it. By the mid-1990s, though, the writing was on the wall. Emissions standards tightened again. The regulations that had seemed strict in the 1970s now seemed lenient. Fuel economy rules got stricter. Every gallon mattered more. Packaging mattered more. Modern crash standards demanded crumple zones and specific structures. Inline engines were long. They needed space. Space that modern trucks couldn't spare. They were heavy. Weight that affected fuel economy and payload capacity. They were hard to fit with modern crash standards that demanded specific front-end geometry. Ford needed lighter engines, shorter engines, more efficient engines. The 300 was officially retired after the 1996 model year. 31 years. Let that sink in. Three decades of production. Minimal fundamental changes. Outliving entire V8 families that came and went during its run. And even after production ended, the 300 didn't disappear. It just kept working. Today, you'll still find them running. All over North America. Powering irrigation pumps in California fields. Running generators at remote work sites. Sitting in barns, waiting to be woken up after years of sleep. Still working in trucks that should have been scrapped decades ago. Some have been turbocharged by enthusiasts who discovered the bottom end could handle boost. Some stroked to increase displacement even further. Some modified to make over 400 horsepower while keeping the original block. And the block takes it. Because it was never built for the edge, it was built for survival. It has margins that modern engines can't match. That's the hidden truth most people miss. The Ford 300 inline six didn't win races. It didn't dominate magazines. It didn't become a muscle car icon. It never inspired posters or dreams, but it did something harder. It showed up every day for 30 years. While flashy V8s came and went, the 300 stayed. While muscle cars became collectibles, the 300 kept working. While other engines became legends, the 300 became essential. Because Ford, for once, didn't chase excitement. They chased endurance. They asked the right question at the right time, and they answered it correctly. And that decision paid off more than anyone expected. So next time someone tells you, power is everything, remember this engine, 300 cubic inches, seven main bearings, long stroke, low RPM, no drama, just an engine that refused to die. That's why it outlived entire V8 families. That's why it matters. If you enjoyed this deep dive, let me know in the comments what engine story you want next. Another forgotten workhorse, a legendary rivalry, or a design that changed everything. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next story buried under the noise of history. Some engines chase glory. Some engines chase survival. The Ford 300 chose survival. And it won.